everybody. Hey, guys. Um, so uh, I'm Jed Dieterich. And I'm Sean Darcy, uh, tra trading director at the Trade Desk. Been there for a couple of years. Before that, I was at a soft commodities derivatives firm. Um, seven years doing that before finally burning out of finance for good. Yep, and I'm uh, GM of business development at the Trade Desk. Fancy way of saying I'm a sales guy at the Trade Desk. I'm the dumb one in this relationship, as you'll find out soon. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about today is uh, I I accelerated planning um, and, and kind of how media planning happens and, and ways we've seen it work better uh, working with some of our partners. So how many people in this room, just by show of hands, have planned media in the past or today? Good morning. So a good amount of people. How many of you feel like you've had the proper data in front of you while building the plan uh, to set yourself off in a good place? Few people. Cool. So that's <laughs> what we're going to work on today. Cool. Um, so, so a lot of the time, the media process is fragmented. A lot of the time, uh, the, the data comes kind of after the plan. So in post-campaign wrap-up reporting, uh, mid-campaign insights, and then we can only use what we see in the RFP process, right, to, to kind of take a guess at, at what's going to work best. Totally. And what we've been trying to work on at the Trade Desk is getting those insights into the planner's hands before they even put an impression in market. Exactly. So one way when I receive, as a media buyer, uh, a plan coming from an RFP, we'll start with a big audience. It would be the gray box up there, the universe. And we say, target males 18 to 35. Then through optimization, I can start to see some of these users who go on to convert, who have that characteristic male 18 to 35. And we trim around that waste you see up there where we're not seeing those users go on to convert. The problem is, I don't have any insight into the users who don't fall into that original targeting, that male 18 to 35 segment. So there's potentially up to 80, 90% of users who I don't get to collect any information on during the optimization process. So one way that a lot of DSPs and different companies have solved for that issue is introducing learn budgets. And so it's a really great way and a great idea to basically put a bunch of media in market. A lot of the time they allocate a certain amount of budget certain amount of time for the campaign to actually scan uh, all of what's out there, to try to find all of those pockets, right, to not do what Sean talked about and kind of isolate a bucket that we have to work with them. Um, so, so hopefully with that, you get your bucket, you also get uh, the other pieces that you weren't necessarily planning to find but are there. Um, but part of the trouble is you also have to buy the whole blue area. Right. Imagine me walking up and introducing myself to everyone in the room saying, Will you open an account? Will you open an account? It takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of money before we even get to these optimizations. If we can start breaking them out and targeting exactly who we want to uh, in order to put this plan into, per into a good spot, we're trying to shift those learnings to the beginning. Yeah, so what we're really, what we're really talking about is taking uh, the process of the learn budgets and the scanning everything and learning, and moving that back into the planning process. So we've worked with a lot of fantastic agency partners to really do that and to bring the kind of data uh, that we generate so much of in, in real time into the planning process so that without spending a single dollar, without putting a single impression in market, we've already generated the best possible hypotheses that we can work with them. Um, so, so that's what we're talking about when we say accelerating on-ramps and, and reducing learn budgets. Sure. So we're gonna take a quick case study and this will be a financial firm, online account openings. We started by examining first party data that we had collected along with the agency that we worked with in order to look at historical account openings by date. You'll see up here, we'll see, we have some trends that are pretty clear. Saturday and Sundays, we have about half the amount of account openings that we do Monday through Friday. But the one thing that like really stands out here is what happened on that huge spike date right there in the middle. Those dates was the uh, August 24th, 25th, and 26th. And on those dates, there is a huge crash in the Chinese markets that led to a three-day sell-off that was the worst sell-off in the Dow Jones in over three years. So we wanted to take those users who are really important users that were likely to react to such a big sell-off in the market and profile them and find out what characteristics they had in order to go out and target those users in the future. Right, so these are really valuable people. We, we get a chance to react, or to see who reacts, who are opportunists, who are very active people. We talked about this as a financial service advertiser who's looking for account openings. 
Well, these are people who take action or who are going to be really engaged. So uh, the other way we looked at this um, was as compared to typical account openings, there are those three days that Sean called out. So the, the, the bigger bars um, are uh, the new activity, uh, the people who are uh, reacting to the sell-off, and, and the rest is the average from what we saw across the rest of the campaign. And the big thing to highlight here is if we don't put the, the impressions in market in that first day where the users are opening up those accounts, if we wait three days, we've missed our opportunity. So it's super important to be very targeted with our impressions immediately when we start to see these actions take place in exactly. the sell-off in the market. And remember, this is all happening before the campaign goes live, right? So we saw this happen and we analyzed it before this all happened. So we know next time there's a huge event, who it's gonna be that's gonna react. And we can use that to target impressions and think about how to message those people. One way we do that uh, is by uh, looking at their path to conversion. So uh, we're an omni-channel DSP. Uh, we see tremendous uh, volumes across all channels. Um, those you know, aren't just opportunities to buy impressions. They're also opportunities to learn about people uh, and learn about their actions. So um, one thing that we can do is take that incremental audience, that sell-off audience, and segment it within our DMP, and then look at what are the sites people are going to, in this case, four hours. Uh, before a conversion, in this case, before an account opening. Uh, and that can become a site list, or those can become sites that we want to strike private deals with, so that next time something like this happens, we're at the right place. Sure, and if we actually take a look at what these profiles look like, um, believe it or not, people go to finance sites before they open up an account for a, an investing firm. Uh, but we can take a look at the site portfolio up here, we use those sites to go out and negotiate deals, use platform-wide statistics to get the right price point for our agencies. And we also look at the third-party data portfolio that goes along with those users. So we start to see, oh, looks like there's some iBankers in the portfolio. They might own a Rolls-Royce or a Porsche. They're active ETF traders. These are super high importance um, profile characteristics for these users in the sell-off period, which kind of makes sense for they're reacting to a huge sell-off in the market. These are the most savvy investors, and we're gonna go out and target them. We can also turn this model upside down. So find the lowest relevant sites and the lowest relevant data segments in order to kind of eliminate those blue areas that we were talking about with the learn budget, where users don't go, to, or users who we see on these sites do not go on and open an account. They also can turn the model upside down and say, what are the least likely characteristics of a user who does not go on and open up an account for this, uh, for this advertiser? So let's start by blocking those. Let's start by not targeting those sites and those audiences. Right, eliminate the waste before we even put an impression in market. Exactly. We can also do this by modeling geographically down to the city and town level. So the areas in green on the board, those are the places that are most relevant and what's common amongst them is they're right around financial hubs. They're actually not the cities where New York, Boston, they're the areas surrounding the cities, the suburbs of the big financial hubs. We can also take the red dots on the map up there and turn those into a block list, a geo -block level block list to say in certain areas in say Wyoming or Idaho, we're not gonna have much luck opening up accounts here. Let's block them right from the very start. The last thing that I, I, I love talking about is uh, IP modeling, where uh, in the U.S. where we do see IP ranges, uh, you can take a look and, and basically do the same sort of relevant score and say, these are the companies that people were in when they took action and opened accounts. Uh, as compared to the number of people that we see inside that IP range, there's an especially high volume of people taking action. So these are actually some of the companies that we saw in this case study. Sure, and this is a great B2B solution. If you're looking for what companies are going to the page, opening up these accounts, we can profile them against every company in the United States in order to say, take these companies, this is where you're most likely to drive your success. You kind of see United States Senate's up there, <laughs> Macquarie Holding Company. Um, there's a couple financial institutes that make sense, but there's also a few places where maybe we wouldn't have thought to look in the first place. Nike profiled really high during the spike period. We also saw uh, PayPal 
a couple um, healthcare companies, but it really combed through the entire data set and put together the best uh, plan for us to start for the next time that we saw a big sell-off like this. You have to wonder if those senators knew about the sell-off before it happened, right? <laughs> yeah. So at, at the end of the day, um, we saw this work, right? All of that happened before we launched any media, and then we launched and optimized. So a lot of that work would happen in auto optimization, a lot of that would happen in a learn budget, but we did it beforehand with the agency. Um, so some of the results. Sure, so when we, when we implemented these models and started targeting these high profile sites, these high profile IPs, third party data segments and geos, we started off uh, on the far left, we were getting around 15% of every online converter had seen an impression from the trade desk before they converted. Over the course of time, for the next 90 days, we brought that up to 75% of all users had seen an impression before converting. And that's uh, it, part of the story, and the other part is that we drove up the incremental volume uh, of conversions, right? So uh, as we did that, we not only reached more of the right people and more of the people who were converting and hopefully drove higher value actions, but we also drove incrementally uh, a higher volume of, of account openings. Um, so. That's our story. Um, we wanted to invite Brian back up um, for some Q&A. Okay, cool. Um, so I have a question, if you, because we were having this discussion last week. Is, do you guys see value in unviewed impressions? I mean, there's this, all this focus on viewability. Yep. I've been told that there actually is value to unviewed impressions. Yeah. I. I I don't think that once we see that an impression was not viewed, we don't see a whole lot of value in it. Oh, really? Um, so you don't see? I mean, I, it, at the end of the day, what we're doing is talking to our agencies and their advertisers about uh, what their goals are. Um, and so uh, if part of their goals involves buying unviewed impressions and then optimizing toward those that are driving the performance they're looking for, some of them choose to do that. But more and more, viewability is table stakes. And then yeah. we're talking about performance. Okay. Sure, but some of those unviewed impressions actually feed into these models that we're talking about. So while they may not have had the desired impact with the delivered impression, we can still use that impression delivered to someone who went on and opened up an account and use it to inform a lookalike model or a site lookalike model to give us knowledge about who might go on and convert in the future. Yeah, okay, see, that's interesting. Uh, Want to open it up to questions? A couple microphones. How you doing? Uh, very interesting stuff. Question for you. Your data seems to point to a reactionary behavior. Mm. Is there any, have there been any instances where you've been able to predict outcomes in advance or seen um, any data that's leading up to a point at which you can help one of your clients? Sure. So we can take this model and slice it in a number of ways. In this case, we profiled the users who reacted to the big sell-off so that the next time that we see a big self, we have the audience targeting the site list, the site block list, so that we know exactly where to put the media in place. But we can segment um, the whole con number or the whole universe of converters. Maybe we want to look at who converts at lunchtime or who converts while the market's open versus the market's closed. What does a weekend converter look like? What does a weekday converter look like? If you really wanted to, you could get down and say, what does somebody in South Dakota uh, run them through the same models and go out and have a, a specific plan to go target South Dakota versus maybe New York City. I would imagine the two profiles look entirely different. But to answer your question, yes, we can look at this in a number of different ways in order to profile what is deemed to be a high value user. In this case, it was a user who reacted to a large sell off. Yeah, I, I think that you know, to your question, what we're doing is we're creating educated <laughs> hypotheses. And uh, in, in a lot of those cases, we're predicting what people are go going to act like. In this case, these were reactive people. A lot of the time, you know, it's, it's you know, people who buy CPG brands on an ongoing basis. So it's not as much people who are, uh, you know, dramatically reacting to something. But even in those cases, we're saying this is typically where they are. You know, every 30 days, they buy a new shampoo um, on an ongoing basis. So we're going to predict that that's where they'll be, and that's where they'll engage. Um, I think there's one right here. 
That's a good question. Um, so obviously a lot of your business is through self-serve platforms. So is this a planning tool that you guys are giving to the traders or is it something that they have to work with your team to do the analysis? You know, it sounds pretty like a lot of heavy lifting, so. Sure, so it's a combination of the two. So a lot of the stuff that we saw there um, was generated self-service by the agency partner. Uh, a lot of the stuff uh, came from uh, some data that they were pulling from our platform. We enable all transparency, all data comes out of our platform, we can pipe it into agency systems. So there's a combination of a lot of those models were pulled directly from our system, others were data sources that we plugged into that generated those models. Okay, um, this one right here. So what are you guys doing to address <coughs> hygiene? Say that again, sorry. What are you doing to address hygiene? Hygiene? Yeah. Inventory quality. Uh, we're doing I, I assume that's what he's talking about. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it seems fine up here. Yeah. So. Like I, I showered at the spa before this presentation, I promise. Right, yeah. um, so uh, we're doing a lot. I, we have uh, a combination of steps that we take on our side to uh, block everything, you know, any non-human audited traffic. We block at the exchange level. There's a whole host of things that we do to just not even see that stuff. Um, prior to that, we have a whole lot of integrations with pre-bid partners, IAS, Double Verify, or a couple. Um, to do all of their blocking. We also have post-bid integrations to report on those things, and uh, we have pretty aggressive terms with all of our suppliers that we buy from around uh, not buying that stuff. Okay, we're out of time, but thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thanks. it. Okay, um, we're gonna come back in, uh,